Great. Thanks for that uh, introduction, Stefan. And welcome, everybody. Welcome to the presentation tonight. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen and we'll get into it. So as Stefan mentioned, my name is Cody Moore. I am the student recruitment manager or one of the student recruitment managers who work at the University of Melbourne. My particular area of expertise is in the Faculty of Business and Economics, the Melbourne Graduate School of Education, and also the Melbourne Law School. So if there's anyone here that does have any questions about law, I can answer those as well. But for tonight, I'm going to be focusing on business and education. So in Australia, what we like to do when we start presentations or when we start meetings is to think about where we are. So I would like to commence this presentation by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm joining you today and the traditional lands on which our campuses are situated. So today I'm joining you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and I pay my respect to their elders past and present. And I ex extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians who've made a contribution to the life of the university community and they continue to do so, a very rich and exciting continuous history that we have at the University of Melbourne. So before I start talking about business or education, I'm going to set the scene a little bit talking about the city of Melbourne. So I'm not sure if any of you have ever been to Melbourne before, uh, but it is a really vibrant city, a very multicultural city. Uh, you can see some of the stats there that we were the world's most livable city for us, uh, was that seven years running? Uh, and we're certainly top five every year. Uh, also top five world's most student-friendly city, fifth safest city in the world. Uh, but it's some of those, some of the next stats that I think are the most exciting. Very multicultural city. There are so many different restaurants, festivals, markets that you can go to, hearing all sorts of different languages, trying new foods, meeting new people. And Melbourne is the home to 8,000 festivals, exhibitions and events every year. So a city of almost 5 million people putting on 8,000 festivals and events makes it a very exciting place to be. And some of these festivals include things like the Melbourne International Film Festival. We recently had the Melbourne Comedy Festival, which is just the best time to be out in the city. Every little possible stage space, every little room is booked out the whole way across the city. Everyone comes in, the streets are thronging with people, all going to comedy shows. It's a, it's a really fun place. Uh, to be walking around all the bars and clubs and restaurants are full um, at that time we've got lots of sporting events that happen in Melbourne a few of you might be familiar with the Australian Open Tennis which Stefan was mentioning to me before he's been to in Melbourne uh, or the Australian Rules Football where the, the hub in, in Australia for that um, with the Grand Prix the Australian uh, Melbourne Grand, Grand Prix as well there's whatever it is that you're interested in there's so many different activities and things that you can get involved in this vibrant city super easy to get around as well uh, being a newer city our, our CBD is a grid so it's quite easy to, to navigate and there's trans trains buses everywhere uh, through the middle of the CBD it's actually free public transport so really easy to get around so now we'll talk a little bit about how UniMel links to that city of Melbourne. You can actually see all the tall buildings in our CBD just at the top of this picture here uh, with the beautiful bay just behind it. Some of you may have heard of St Kilda, a really popular precinct uh, where there's lots of really delicious cakes uh, right on the beach there. And then just here at the north side of the city, this part here, if you can see my mouse moving around, is the University of Melbourne. So we are right on the doorstep of the CBD. This curved street at the end here is called College Crescent, and this is where all of the University of Melbourne traditional colleges are. Then you see in the middle there all of our sports facilities and student recreational facilities, and then we move into all of the academic facilities. This tall building that you see at the back just behind the blue is the Faculty of Business building. The building at the end of the parkland is the Melbourne Law School, and just next to that at the end of the street is the Melbourne Graduate School of Education. And all throughout in between, there's engineering, science, arts facilities, um, there's, there's science and biomedicine re uh, precinct, all sorts of research facilities. So it's a, a, a community just to the north of the, the city of Melbourne, all on its own. So in fact, the University of Melbourne has its own postcode. So this is 
how close we are to the city of Melbourne, but also the place where we, we have our own community. So a few stats about uh, University of Melbourne specifically, rather than just the city of Melbourne. It is a really beautiful city campus. Uh, there's a few other institutes around that are, are close to the city, but they're very much just city buildings or city blocks. We're so lucky to have all of the fabulous parklands and sporting facilities right on campus as well. Uh, we have students. I mentioned before that the city of Melbourne has people from over 200 countries living here. Uh, on our campus, we have students from over 135 different countries. So pretty good rep representation. 40% of the students on campus are international students. So a really great mix, uh, but also lots of opportunities to get to know domestic students and, and Australian students while you're there as well. Uh, each year, we currently have about 50,000 students enrolled with us. And the university has been around since 1853, which is pretty old for an Australian university. I know some of the ones in the UK have been around a little bit longer, but that's that's pretty good pretty good uh, innings for, a, for an Australian university. And one of the stats we're most proud of is being number eight in the world for global employability. So while we are very well known for all of our academic and research uh, skills, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on, it's building those work ready and career ready skills that we've really put a lot of focus on uh, in the last few years and really embedded into all of our programs. So students are able to go out with the reputation of a world leading university, but also with those career leading skills. So it's the best of both worlds there. So across the University of Melbourne, those 50,000 students are studying one of these different areas broadly. So from everything from agriculture through to music and science back to engineering. But as you can see in bold there, the two that I'm speaking about today, the business and economics, where we are currently ranked 26 in the world, or education, where we are currently 12th in the world. And for both of those, we are number one in Australia. So this is a little bit about what our campus looks like. The next few slides, I just thought for those of you that haven't been to Melbourne or haven't been to the University of Melbourne, I just give you a little bit of a feel about what it might look like as if you were walking through the campus. So this is one of the main thoroughfares in the centre of our campus here. Um, to the left, you can see the grass area of our South Lawn. Right in front is our old quad building, our original buildings uh, back in 1853 when the university first opened. Uh, and over to the right are a lot of our science precinct um, and facilities. So from this end, we're now looking back down the other end of the walkway through the old quad. So we have these beautiful heritage listed buildings. Uh, a lot of students get very excited walking through these corridors. They feel like it looks a bit like Hogwarts. Um, lots of, you can feel the history as you walk through this beautiful place. Our iconic clock tower as well so that's just to the left of the uh, of the old quad but we also have a whole lot of new precincts and new architecture so this is our arts precinct uh, just next to our the, one of the largest libraries on campus and so this is where all of our art students would study uh, there's a lot of student lounges in there and this building was actually has won some architectural awards uh, for its sustainability and for its usability for the students. You can see some of the, the lovely student spaces on the inside there as well. So there's a mixture of old and new, lots of history, lots of award-winning spaces. It's a very, very exciting place to be studying. This here is actually one of the main lecture theatres on campus and it's in our Faculty of Business and Economics. So this is the Copeland Theatre uh, where we have guest lectures, we have lots of keynote speeches from uh, academics right around the world come and present to our students, but also to our staff and to the general public. Um, but this one here, you can see a class is going on, one of our business classes. So not just the spaces, but it's what we do in those spaces that make it so such an exciting place to be studying. So I mentioned a little bit before about having those career ready skills being number eight for employability in the world. These are some of the ways that we embed that into the courses, all of the courses across the uni that the students would be studying. So there are pracs, there are field trips, there's work integrated learning. So in the classroom, the students are working on real problems, really building those skills, not just theory, not just case studies. So there's a bit of that as well. We have a mentoring program as well. In fact, there's probably a few mentoring programs across the university. Um, but there's peer mentoring where we actually have groups of students 
who are put into little groups uh, as part of orientation. Every student is put into a group. It's up to you then to choose to, to go along and join that group if you'd like to, but everyone is, is welcome to be involved. Uh, and the students actually get together and, and they're able to ask questions about how to navigate university life um, in these groups. So it's the, really a supported way to join the university. There's internship opportunities. Some are volunteered, some are paid, some are embedded into courses, and some are optional extras through summer and winter semesters. Um, depending on what it is that you're interested in, there's certainly lots of opportunities, and there are teams in the faculties and in the central part of the university who can help you to find those opportunities too. So it's about finding the right scene for you. So outside of the classroom, there's lots of places where you can go, where you can find people who are maybe working on the same kind of projects as you, some plates and students who might have similar interests to you. You might want to be where all the action is in the middle of the food court with the, I don't know, the gaming rooms uh, and being around lots of people. There's absolutely spaces like that. There's also in the new, our new student pavilion, um, a beanbag room, if you just want to go and chill out and hang out uh, and, and have a bit of quiet time as well. So there's lots and lots of different spaces uh, for students to find where it is that they feel the most comfortable on campus uh, and lots of support for you to know what those opportunities are as well. So while you're thinking about potentially coming to Melbourne and studying with us here in Australia, once you are studying here, there are lots of opportunities for you to continue that travel as part of your course, going to other parts of the world as well. <coughs> excuse, excuse me, just a tickle there. <coughs> so depending on what programs you're doing and what the uh, space is in your course, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> there are lots of chances for you to pick up short trips that you might do as part of your course. It might be two or three weeks, might be an intensive subject, or you could also do semesters abroad, even if you are already studying abroad uh, in Melbourne. And really it's about the community that you build here. Sorry, I've had a tickle for a few days now. I was hoping it would stay away this evening. Uh, so it's really about the community that you would build at the University of Melbourne as well. So there are official support for you. So stop one, as it sounds like, is the first place you would go for most questions you would have as a current student. They can help you with uh, your timetabling, with your classes, any questions you had about your fees or any opportunities on campus, scholarships, anything like that. Stop one can certainly help. But then there's more of the informal ways as well where you could be getting to know your classmates through workshops and uh, opportunities like that. The orientation program, I highly recommend everybody gets involved in to really get to know what clubs you might join or what opportunities there might be to, to meet other like-minded people. We have an official Ask Alumni opportunity as well, where people who have graduated from the University of Melbourne, both Australian students and international uh, students as well, who are part of that formal alumni program where you can actually ask them questions. So it's a little bit of a mentoring and even career progression opportunity there as well. So that's a bit about the city of Melbourne, about the University of Melbourne. Now let me tell you a little bit about the Melbourne Business School. So this is part of the Faculty of Business and Economics, but our graduate programs are grouped together as the Melbourne Business School. And you see the beautiful Copeland Theatre there again. So we group our courses into three different areas there. Our pre-experience programs are perfect for people who've come from a totally different area wanting to now delve into business, or it could be for people who've come straight from an undergraduate degree progressing into graduate study. So the Master of Management suite and also the Master of International Business. Those courses there do not expect people to have had any work experience in the business area, or in fact, any work experience at all. It's really based on academic merit. Uh, there's a few technicalities there. If you're looking at moving into finance or accounting, you may need to have a, bit, a couple of particular subjects, but generally it's people with no business background uh, wanting to move into business. So I'll talk a bit about those in a moment. In the middle, you can see our specialist master's programs. So these are for people who do have specific experience. Perhaps you've come from a cognate or a, 
um, a, a, an aligned undergraduate degree. Excuse me. Uh, or perhaps you've had some work experience and you're coming back to, to progress that course in that area as well. <coughs> Sorry. And we do have a couple of wholly online programs. And these are for both ends of the spectrum. Our graduate certificate in business is particularly for students who don't have that experience in business, who want to do uh, six months of study just to build that experience and progress into a master's program. We also have the Master of Professional Management and the Master of Supply Chain Management for people who are mid-career, people who've already got some work experience and want to come and progress their careers or formalise their experience. So we'll delve a little deeper into those pre-experience courses here. So I said before the Master of Management suite, within that there are these six different courses that you could do. So Master of Management Accounting, Master of Management Accounting and Finance together, Master of Management Finance, HR, Management or Marketing. They're all separate courses. None of them expect that you've got any particular background in business except for the accounting and finance, which does need you to have done uh, a little bit of accounting there. But there's also the Master of International Business as well. So all of these are our entry level courses. They're all available as a two year course for people who do not have that business background. If you do have a business background though, you could apply for a one and a half year version and get credit for, for four of those subjects or, or half a year. And the beauty of these courses is that they are very career focused. So you might have done an undergraduate degree in science and now you're looking at adding perhaps management on top of that. Or you might have done arts and now you're looking at adding marketing on top of that. So it really complements what you've done in your undergraduate degree and allows you to build that suite of business skills on top to progress your career. So then when we talk about some of our specialist master programs, we have the Master of Economics as opposed to the Master of Applied Econometrics. So the difference really between these two, if you're looking at economics, then you're looking at broad strategy, you're looking at uh, perhaps uh, the way that a, a business or, or even a, a community might be spending their money. Um, but if you're looking at the applied econometrics, then you're looking at the data analysis behind that. So even though there is an element of a huge element of maths in economics, in applied econometrics, you'll be looking at why and how those particular statistics are working. So if you like the idea of strategy and planning and money, but you're also really interested in the data analysis, then the econometrics might be the, uh, the stream that you take there. With the econ economics uh, course, that is a two-year course, only begins at the start of each year, uh, and the students do need to have a strong mathematical background to apply for that one. The econometrics there is a year and a half, again, also starts just at the start of the year, but also includes a research component. So you're taking some of that data analysis and actually starting to build that towards perhaps an ongoing career or further study in research. And then the enhanced option has a longer research project. So it actually makes the course six months longer at the end. So you could leave after one and a half years with the Master of Applied Econometrics, or you could choose early on in the course to do the two-year version and actually do that longer thesis, so a 10,000-word thesis instead of 4,000 words, uh, and, and complete that over the two-year program. So very similar but very different outcomes. The Master of Digital Marketing is a very popular course. Uh, a lot of people think that digital marketing is like social media marketing. Not quite the same. This one is, again, analytical. So this is for people who are who have a background in business, but quite a strong background in mathematics as well. So looking at the analytics behind marketing, behind how people act the way that they do when engaging with advertising. So it's not just about social media, it's more of that back end, the, the Google analytics and the data aspect behind, the, behind marketing. Uh, people who come into this course do need to have quite a strong background in business or commerce alongside that maths and stats as well. 
Uh, students who are looking at this course but perhaps don't have that strong business background or don't have that particular interest in the analytical side could look at the Master of Management Marketing. So those two courses are often ones that students are trying to decide between, but really once you delve into the difference between the two, it, it's often quite obvious which one is, is more relevant to what it is that you're interested in. So this is a really popular area at the moment as well as a lot of buzz around entrepreneurship, lots of people starting side hustles, lots of opportunity for people to, to be getting their own little businesses off the ground. Uh, so that's traditional entrepreneurship. There's also the concept of intrapreneurship where people are actually working in larger corporations or working in bigger businesses, but building the skills around innovation and problem solving. So through this suite of courses, the Master of Entrepreneurship and the Master of Entrepreneurship Enhanced particularly, students are, are taught the skills around entrepreneurship, so a lot of self-start and starting your own little business or big business, hopefully, um, but also entrepreneurship. So using those innovation and, and problem solving skills that, that I think are going to be really useful and really useful career skills moving forwards as more and more um, processes are being automated. Things like innovation and problem solving is always going to be required from humans. So this is something that we do try and teach through, uh, through the Master of Entrepreneurship courses. Uh, this one here, you can see it's enhanced, is six months longer. A little different to the economics course where this one's actually enhanced at the beginning. So for anyone who doesn't have a foundation in entrepreneurship, then you'd probably be looking at the Master of Entrepreneurship Enhanced. That's the one and a half year option. Where you do the six months, it's kind of equivalent to the graduate certificate in entrepreneurship, uh, building those foundational skills. And then the final year of that entrepreneurship enhanced aligns with the Master of Entrepreneurship. So a one year course uh, progressing those skills. Uh, the beauty of the way that this course is taught at the University of Melbourne is that it's in partnership with the Wade Institute, which is based up on College Crescent, if you remember that image that I was showing earlier um, of the University of Melbourne. So in one of our old colleges, we have a beautiful new facility called the Wade Institute, and it is a hub for entrepreneurs. So the networking and the idea generation and the business starting that happens there is pretty electric. It's a very special place to be studying. Also, because it's based in the college, the students then get free access to the cafeteria there. They get hot lunches every day. It's a pretty, pretty popular program, that one. The Master of Finance is probably our flagship course. This is definitely the one that I get asked about the most. It's very highly regarded in the industry. And this is for students who do come with a background in finance who are looking to enhance those skills. So the entry requirements here are a little higher than some of our courses. Uh, the general weighted average mark we're looking for is the equivalent to a University of Melbourne 75, whereas a lot of the others I didn't mention, but they're usually around 65 to 70. Uh, this one does require uh, applicants to have done three particular finance uh, subjects. If you have done a lot of finance in your background, uh, but have only perhaps done two out of the three required subjects, then we now have an option to uh, allow students to do a bridging program in the semester break, uh, just prior to between applying and commencing the next semester, uh, you're able to do a bridging program to complete that extra subject if needed. Um, so if anyone's interested in knowing a bit more about that, I can, I can let you know, but that's a, a great opportunity where we used to have people who'd only done two of the three not having an option to get in. We now have these bridging subjects. And as I mentioned at the start, we do have uh, some wholly online programs. So not particularly useful if you're looking to get a, a student visa and come and join us in beautiful Melbourne. Uh, but if you are interested in progressing your career or commencing your career through the graduate certificate, then these are great online options just to dip your toe into what it is that we do offer at the University of Melbourne. So I know a few people who are joining us today are interested in our research options uh, in business. And it's really great that you are here to hear a little bit about it because the way that we offer these research courses is quite different to most other universities in Australia. In fact, it's an American model that we do just in the Faculty of Business and Economics. The rest of the University of Melbourne uh, does a different way, which I'll talk about when we get to education. But for business, it's a five-year research model. And this is a two-year Master of Coursework degree, followed by a three-year PhD. And 
it's not just any master's that you would do in that two years. It's specifically a master of commerce around building research skills. So you don't need to go and find uh, your own sponsor. You don't need to find, you don't need to know what your idea is. You don't need to have a hypothesis when you commence this five years. You just need to know that you are interested in doing the research and that you've got a little bit of background in, well, quite a bit of background in a business area. Uh, and then through that first two years in the Master of Commerce, you'll be taught how to research. You'll be taught how to explore ideas. Your, any hypothesis that you come up with in that first particular year will be really tested and, and questioned by other people in the class so that at the end of the two years, you're absolutely sure what it is that you would like to go on and research in your PhD. And at that stage, you will have had two years getting to know the lecturers at the University of Melbourne, the Faculty of Business and Economics particularly, and you'll have your sponsor there to be able to continue into your PhD. So it's quite a different model to... to um, the other parts of the University of Melbourne and other Australian universities, but it's a really strong model uh, that allows students to absolutely know what it is that they want to research and how it is that they'll be able to research that to really feel ready to move into that PhD afterwards. However, if you are interested in actuarial studies or business administration and analytics, then it is possible to go into a more traditional PhD without doing the adjoining two-year coursework degree. So very broadly across a lot of those courses that I've just spoken about, so it's just 10 minutes to quickly give you an overview of the Faculty of Business and Economics, the general entry requirements there, the selection committee will be looking at your overall performance in your previous studies. So it may be an undergraduate degree, it may be other graduate study, they'll be looking at your overall performance on all years of attempted study. So not just your final score on your final year. They'll be looking at the consistency of your performance and in particular subjects. So obviously the finance that I was mentioning where we needed the 75 WAM overall, you would also need the 75 WAM in those individual subjects that are prerequisites. So it's worth knowing that as well. For all of our, or most of our business programs, you are required to submit a personal statement. No more than 500 words. It doesn't need to be a thesis, but we just want to know why it is that you would like to study this particular course, just to make sure that you are applying for the course that is best going to suit your experience and your interests. So it is possible that the admissions team or the course coordinator may see that personal statement and actually realize that there's another course we offer that would be much better suited to what it is you're trying to get from the course and they can make that recommendation to you. It doesn't happen that often, but that is one of the things that the personal statement can be used for. It's really just about your motivation in your words. Uh, we'll certainly look at the English language requirements and for some of the courses, you do require the GMAT or the GRE. Uh, we are we will accept online results for those and it's the same st uh, study score the same score as if you'd gone to the testing center as well for international students we do have uh, 25 percent and 50 percent fee remission scholarships the faculty of business and economics is actually known for having one of the most generous scholarship programs at the university of melbourne uh, and these 25% and 50% fee remissions will be assessed at the time of application. So you don't need to apply separately for those scholarships. It will be automatically considered alongside your course application. Uh, and this will be based on academic merit. So looking at your scores and your grades compared to everybody else who's applying in that particular year. All right, we'll move on to the Melbourne Graduate School of Education. I think perhaps, I'm not sure if there's questions that have come through, Stefan, but maybe we'll just wait for the end and I'll answer all the questions all at once. I'm sure there's lots of them. I'm sure you're all waiting to ask me lots of questions. Uh, but if you've got any, have a think about it, pop them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. So I'll move on to the Melbourne Graduate School of Education. So within uh, MGSE, we like a lot of acronyms at the University of Melbourne. So the Mad Melbourne Graduate School of Education, also known as MGSE, we really have two groups of courses. So a little bit like where business, there was the, the pre-experience and the, and the experienced courses. We have the Master of Teaching suite for people who have come straight from an undergraduate program looking to specialise in their graduate study in teaching. Uh, also for people who might be changing careers and looking at coming into teaching. 
And then the other group of courses I'll talk about in a moment are our courses for professionals. So people who are already in the education field, maybe as a teacher, maybe in some other role, who are looking to continue their studies. So we'll talk about teaching first. We have four main streams here for international students. We have early childhood, which is really working in that zero to kindergarten age. There is the option to, to work into the first couple of years of school, depending on the school that you're working at, but really it's for that kindergarten teaching. Uh, then there's the Master of Teaching Early Childhood and Primary. So kindergarten through to the whole of primary school. So this course here, the students actually do quite a lot more placement than the others. That is 75 days of placement so that they are getting a significant amount of placement in both the early childhood or kindergarten setting and a primary school setting. So the students are well equipped to move in both spaces. Then we have the separate Master of Teaching Primary for people that know they want to work in the primary school setting and the Master of Teaching Secondary. Now, the big difference uh, that's worth noting with the Master of Teaching Secondary, and it will come up on the next slide as well, is that students do need to have two learning areas or two areas of specialisation that they could teach as a secondary teacher. So you, you might remember from your own days when you're at primary school, the teachers kind of taught a little bit of math and a little bit of English, and maybe they also helped out with PE or art. They do a little bit of everything. In the secondary school setting, we have specialist teachers. So it might be humanities or languages or maths or science. This will be based on what it is that you've studied in your undergraduate degree. So these are the different learning areas that you could uh, enroll in as part of your application or as part of your enrollment as a Master of Teaching secondary student. So if you have done an undergraduate degree in commerce, then you might be looking to become a teacher in accounting, business management, maths. Uh, if you've done an undergraduate degree in arts, then you might be looking at psychology, languages, history, humanities. So you can see how they line up there. So there's a lot of information about learning areas on our website, but this is one we, a question we get asked a lot about how people are uh, make sure that they're on track to, to achieve the entry requirements for both of their learning areas. So it's usually a major in two areas. So the entry requirements for our teaching programs, you need to have completed an undergraduate degree. You need to complete a TCAT, which is a teacher capability assessment tool. This is basically just making sure that not only are you academically able, but you're a good person and that you're going to make a good teacher. So the way that this is tested is through some little scenarios, through a bit of literacy and numeracy testing, a little bit of um, empathy testing. And this is all just a series of questions. It's not really something that you can study for. Uh, it's an online test that's been actually created by the Melbourne Graduate School of Education Research Area. Uh, it's free to take but you can only take it once every 12 months. Uh, and then once you've taken it, those results will last for two years if you want them to. If you weren't happy with it, you could do it again 12 months later. Uh, you won't necessarily get the results because they won't really mean much to you. It's a, it's a series of data sets that our admissions team look at alongside your uh, application. Uh, you can see there that the only area that the only course that requires two learning areas is our secondary course. And then all of the courses do require a high level of English language as well. Now, the other suite of courses that we have in MGSE or education are our courses for professionals. So I know from the UK, our most popular course is the Master of Education. And this is often a, an extension program for people who are already working in the education field who then want to specialise in a particular area, move into a leadership role uh, or move into some kind of specialisation assisting in a school setting. Uh, we also have a Master of Instructional Leadership, particularly great for people who are looking at progressing their career into becoming a coordinator or ultimately a principal. Uh, we have the Master of International Education, specialising in the International Baccalaureate or the IB and a range of research degrees particularly popular with international students or people wanting to work internationally are our language education programs. So our Master of TESOL, which is teaching English as a second or other language, or our Master of Modern Languages Education. 
that suite of psychology programs are particularly popular at the moment coming out of the pandemic there's been a real focus in educational settings around well-being and psychology and these courses were already embedded into what we do at MGSE but they've just been able to really inform a lot of the teaching that we do at the university but then the way we teach the next generation of teachers to go out and work with those students as well. So delving a little deeper into that Master of Education program, there's eight different areas that you could specialise in, depending on what it is you're interested in. If you've already got a background in the education setting and you want to move into leadership and management, then there's an opportunity to specialise. As I mentioned, you could move into student wellbeing. You could move into policy writing. So this is either in a school or for the educational sector. You could move into assessment and pedagogy. So lots of opportunities to really do a deep dive into the area that you would like to progress in. The Master of Education can either be taken as a two-year program or a one-year program. Most of the people that would come into this course would have an educational teaching background and would do the one-year option. Uh, but people sometimes come in who have been working peripherally to an education setting or perhaps working in an ed education setting, but not as a teacher, uh, and then they would be uh, more likely to take up the two-year option. And we also offer a, a range of research degrees in MGSE, or the Melbourne Graduate School of Education. Uh, we have a huge team of researchers who work at the uh, at MGSC, and that's why one of the, the one of the things they were able to create was that TCAT, that teacher capability assessment tool. We're actually the only university in Victoria that has created their own tool. Uh, it's a requirement for anyone wanting to become a teacher uh, in Victoria that they do need to do some kind of tech capability testing uh, online test. And all of the other universities have purchased external tests that the students need to pay for. But through this fabulous research facility that we have at MGSC, we were able to create our own. It's just one example of some of the things that the students have been able to work on. Our research degrees uh, can be done either as a PhD or as a Doctor of Education. The difference really is that the PhD has a much heftier thesis component. So the Doctor of Education has a little bit of that coursework built into it. So it's a little bit of a, of a gentle entry into research for students who do want to uh, build up some of those skills around how to research uh, and perhaps some of the, the networking as well. 55,000 word thesis that comes out of that Doctor of Education. So it's still, still quite a, an impressive body of work um, as opposed to the Doctor of Philosophy and Education where you go straight into research. You'd already have potentially some experience in research uh, and you'd be putting out the 80,000 word thesis. Both of them have on-campus uh, facilities and requirements uh, and both of them are supported by the MGSE research team. Alongside that we also have the Master of Education in Research and the Master of Philosophy. So these ones also on campus, also part of that community but smaller courses and I don't want to diminish them at all, still 20,000 word thesis and 40,000 word thesis, um, but they're, they're just that, that pathway through to the PhD, if that's what you'd like to do, or the thesis uh, and, and the qualification in their own outright as well. So that's a, a snapshot of the two areas that we have. Alongside the academic areas, there are a lot of ways for students to really enhance the studies that they're doing by taking up opportunities to join part of that 50,000 student network on campus. Lots of different clubs, societies and sports, whatever it is that you're interested in, guarantee there is someone else on campus interested in that too. And we also have the UMSU International Ambassador Program. So UMSU is the University of Melbourne Student Union. It's a very active, vibrant community, and there's a particular arm just for international students. So a great opportunity to meet other international students and really contribute to the community life on campus. We also currently have a, or not currently, we have a guarantee for any student who applies for accommodation at the University of Melbourne is guaranteed to be offered a place somewhere. So we have a lot of 
accommodation options either on campus or around campus and we guarantee that every student who applies for one of those will be offered something. Uh, so this includes our 10 fully catered residential colleges. As you remember from that, uh, the map I showed before, these are all around College Crescent with the university campus and the CBD in the background. And supplementing those as the university has grown, so have our accommodation options. We also have a range of quite modern student apartments, uh, a little bit more independent living in the student apartments, though still supported and are still, still a great student uh, vibe. <laughs> These student apartment buildings are based right around the campus, either into the suburb of Carlton nearby or down into the CBD as well. So trying to decide whether the college life or the, the student apartment life might work for you, it's worth thinking about, do you want to live on your own? Do you want to share a room? Do you want to share a facility? Do you want to live really close to campus? You don't mind riding a bike or catching a tram, which are both very common ways to get around Melbourne. Uh, do you want your meals provided? Do Like I was talking about the Wade Institute with entrepreneurship before, do you want to go into a communal hall uh, and, and be getting your meals with the same group of people every day? Or would you rather have a little apartment with your own kitchen, cooking your own food in your own time? So having a think about which one of those lifestyles suits you better. Uh, we do have options just for graduate students. We have options that are a mix of graduate and undergraduate. In most of our accommodation options, we do try and have a mix of male and female, of domestic and international. So it's really uh, an opportunity to get to know a lot of other students as well. So for more information there, you can have a look at housing.unimelv.edu.au. I'm also happy to answer any questions if I can. I mentioned specifically some of the FBE scholarships that we have before, but on top of that, the University of Melbourne also has a range of scholarships uh, for international students. So really worth having a look at our website. A lot of the scholarships that are awarded on academic merit uh, are done so without you having to apply separately. They'll be considered just when you submit your application, but there are some scholarships that you would have to apply for directly. So I always recommend students have a look at the website and apply for everything that they think might be relevant to them. And when should you apply? Right now. For international students who are thinking about studying uh, in semester one, so we work on a calendar year in Australia. Um, so our semester one commences in February or March, depending on the course. And for international applicants for most courses, uh, applications will close on the 31st of October this year. Uh, so I, I put the asterisks there because please do check the website for specific dates. Some courses like the Master of Finance, for example, do close a little bit earlier. Um, but for most courses, it'll be around the 31st of October, or will be the 31st of October. Uh, if you're thinking about perhaps studying in semester two, so commencing in July or August, we have passed the date for semester two this year. So applications closed in April, but you might be thinking about joining us in June, uh, sorry, in July or August 2024. So applications for that round will close in April next year. If there's anyone looking at undergraduate uh, courses, the application would be through a portal called uh, BTAC if you are an overseas Australian. But for most internationals, uh, for all internationals and all graduate applications, please just apply directly to the university. Uh, and you can certainly use author authorised education agents like study options. So please stay in touch. That is an absolute whirlwind of a snapshot of the University of Melbourne, the City of Melbourne, the Faculty of Business and Economics and the Melbourne Graduate School of Education. If there's anything I said that didn't make sense, if I quickly mention something you'd like to know a little bit more about, if there's something you've heard about or read about that, that you'd like to know more about, you can either ask me now or you can uh, have a look at my email address there and, and take down my details and contact me after this. I'm happy to answer any questions.